Okay, I think we'll start. Um, welcome everyone um, to this uh, first online public event um, called Reading Her, Introducing Women uh, Writing Architecture Around 1800. I am Anna Hulch and I'm the leader of uh, WAWA, short for Women Writing Architecture, a project funded by the European Research Council <clears throat> and based here at GTA, GTA, the Institute for the History and Theory of Architecture at ETH Zurich. Today, we have invited a group of researchers you see here to introduce us to a woman writing architecture between 1700 and 1900. Shortly, we will be hearing a series of short portraits of women and their writings that we and the researchers that we've invited conceive as relevant to architectural and spatial histories. Thank you very much for joining us for this hour of what we hope will be inspiration to expand our references, influences, and last but certainly not least, we hope also our reading lists. So who are you reading? Who are we reading? This question, these questions is the origin of this project to ask who we are reading to build our understanding of past spaces, past places, their uses and their constellations. We, as a research team, argue that histories of the built environment need to expand their evidence base to stay relevant in a world of, of planetary challenges, of increasing polarity and inequality. So this is the idea. While writing and publishing imply some privilege in the period we are considering, so the women that we are reading were privileged in the sense that they were able to publish, this practice was far more open than practices of designing and of building architectures. So if we read more women, in our case, one could apply this to other marginalized groups, we will also read more eyewitnesses. We will read more dwellers, we will read more users of space. We will also read more critics, experts, scholars, thinkers. We will if we start from this to build our corpus as historians, we will by necessity difference the canon, to use Griselda Pollock's words. Rather than looking for women following male dominated practices of architecture, such as designing and drawing or building, we, as a group, seek out women who found other ways to shape, influence, critique, document, and in any way reflect on the ways in which their contemporaries and themselves um, encountered and lived in the build. Essentially, I think what we do is we turn things upside down. Rather than starting out from the premise that women had no agency, we assume they did. We credit them with having a voice, with their writing having an impact. We hear them. And we also know that others at their time listened to them as well. So I think it's our job as historians to find appropriate methods to learn, to listen, to read their texts and understand what they tell us about their environments, about buildings, gardens, cities and other spaces. So this is what today is about too, to listen to her writing architecture, to the researchers doing so in very short teasers. So this is a very compact format. So we can see this as an appetizer with the main meal following as we progress with our project. So here are the names of our eight distinguished researchers we have invited today alongside the images of the woman they will introduce us to. I will keep the suspense just a little longer um, who those women are. Unfortunately, I have to say that Barbara Penner was also um, planning to join us um, from University College London, but sadly she cannot be here today. I will not spend much time on introducing each individual speaker. Most of them don't need much introduction anyway. Um, but if you visit our website, the link to which I think should be posted in the chat, um, otherwise you can Google WOWA uh, ETH, um, you can find out their full biographies, more information about um, their work, as well as about our, our project. As to the format, and this will be an up, uh, adapted Pachacucha presentation. Um, each speaker will have five minutes and uh, five images and five minutes with time slides. I will call each speaker, ask them to unmute and start presenting. As we want to keep this format compact and smooth, 
we will not have a long discussion today, but we do invite you to post any comments or questions in the chat. So please do that while you listen to presentations. We will then select just one or two at the end to have a little bit of a reflection, um, but I'm happy to forward any other um, questions to speakers. Um, there's also an email on our website with which, through which you can get in touch with us. Okay, there we go. Our first speaker is Sol Perez Martinez, who is an architect, educator, and also the postdoctoral fellow in my group, in the WAWA group here at ETH. She will now introduce us to Rosa Araneda in exactly five minutes. Once I move to the next slide, her time will start. So Sol, please unmute yourself. It is over to you now. Hello, today I'm introducing Rosa Araneda. Rosa Araneda was a Chilean popular poet born during the 1850s in a small town in the south of Chile. After emigrating from the countryside to the capital, she became well known in Santiago during the late 1880s when she was writing, singing, printing and selling string poetry in the city center, like the one you can see here in the slide. String poetry in Chile consisted of a large sheet of paper, which was printed on one side and sold in streets, markets and train stations, sometimes hanging on a string, which gives the name to its format. Most string poetry was composed of four to eight verses or songs with a large illustration that represented the content of one of the poems, which was wood carved or engraved and a provocative title in large letters, in this case, Gangs in the South, Large Scale Robberies and Murders. In the bottom corner of the page, the author signed Rosa Raneda with her address so people could visit her to buy more poetry. I'm interested in the popular poetry of Araneda because it is produced by and for working class people, presenting their urban experiences during the second half of the 19th century. It is important to know that during the time when Aranea was writing, almost 60% of the population in Santiago were not able to read or write. So the whole page was designed as a communicative device. People who couldn't read the verses were attracted by the images, buying the pamphlets to ask others to perform their content through song or declamation. These pamphlets encapsulate a moment of transition of popular culture between orality and written form, local sources and mass media illiteracy and public education. In this context where few people could read or write, Adanina's work stands out as a female working class perspective of the city, exposing spaces unavailable and unknown to upper class women. In terms of its content, Adanina's poems can be divided in three main themes, versos a lo humano, or verses about social issues, including crimes, politics, humor, and love, versus a lo divino, or verses about divinity, including religion, history, and philosophy, and versus a lo adivino, with riddles and fictional stories based on historical characters. I am particularly interested in the human verses, where Araneda takes the role of an urban and political commentator. For example, in this page, Araneda complains about the sale of a war boat called Esmeralda, right from the perspective of a prisoner who is about to be executed, the birth of Jesus, and the news of a violent raid. However, in between this random content, there is a poem about the Christmas celebrations in the main street of Santiago, La Alameda de las Delicias. In this poem printed in 1894, Araneda presents her perspective and the one of the servants of the ruling elites who ask for permission to leave their duties for the day and stroll along the Chilean aristocracy during Christmas day. Araneda describes the most famous, famous promenade in Santiago, La Alameda de las Delicias, in an environment of celebration and togetherness, giving sensory cues of smells, tastes and activities where people of different classes share the same space. In other poems, Adanella writes about prisons, markets, gallows, trams, brothels, bars, parties, and pawn houses, all parts of the expanding city that educated women would not have access. Along this basis, she also introduces a group of women who didn't write, including the singer, the prostitute, the food seller, and the female tram conductor, among others, some of which would pay for dedicated verses. By studying Adanea's writings and the urban sites that are relevant for her, 
it enriches our understanding of the 19th century and prevents a monolithic representation of urban history, mostly seen from a male upper class perspective of salons, palaces, and churches. Aranola advocated for equality between rich and poor and carved a space for women in a type of political writing that was strictly reserved for men. Arenea is also important because she represented the struggling conditions of a working woman and mother in Chile, while encouraging women to read and write using images like the one that you can see here in the slide. So even though in the past popular poetry was discarded as a lesser form of writing, I believe Arenea's poems are a path to see the 1800s Chilean cities from a new perspective, from a female working class perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Sol. Our next speaker is Elena Riga, who is an art historian and PhD fellow in the WAWA group here at ETH. So Elena, please unmute yourself. Elena will now introduce us to um, Emilie von Berlepsch. Here you go, Elena. Emily von Berlepsch, nee von Oppel, later Harms, was a German writer who lived from 1755 to 1830. Here we see a an illustration of a medallion with her portrait. It is the front page of Berlepsch's publication, Summer Hours, a collection of poems that she published in 1794. Besides poems, she published texts about women's rights, an essay about the invasion in Switzerland in 1798, and travel writings, mostly published in magazines. Today, I want to talk about one travel account in particular. Emily Berlepsch traveled to Scotland and the Scottish Highlands between 1799 and 1800 and published her journey with the title Caledonia between 1802 and 1804 in four volumes. It was the first German travel account of the Highlands and Berlepsch's first extensive publication on travel writing. Caledonia was based on diary entries, letters, essays, and conversations with people she had met. She also discussed English and Scottish literature and included legends. She describes the castles she sees on the way, the small cities she comes across, and the many lakes. She writes about the people that live in the highlands and gives us an insight about the society and status of education with a special emphasis on female education. Her descriptions of architecture are predominantly concise and sharp. She does not hesitate to evaluate what she sees, whether it's good or bad. She describes the castles and mansions with great emphasis on the gardens and the landscapes. Some buildings she describes in great detail, including the history of the building and its owners. Berlepsch also describes infrastructures and factories, as well as manufacturing processes of various commodities. She also describes the system of land tenure in great detail. At one point, Berlepsch talks about the huts and the highlands and discusses them as a building type in great detail and at length, including materials, exterior and interior, and how the types vary. She bases her decision on the fact that, in her opinion, authors of other travelogues had not managed to describe the huts in a way that would have evoked an image or clear vision. I quote, you have certainly read many descriptions of the mountain huts of the Scots, but I doubt that you imagine them so poorly than they actually are, nor has any writer I know of who has traveled in Scotland's mountains depicted them in such a way that you could get a proper idea of them. Think of small rectangular wall boxes made of pebbles or other stones without mortar and clay put together quite crudely the spaces between the large stones stuffed with small ones and the small ones with moss. The best of these huts are divided into two rooms, one for the family and the other for all kinds of livestock. In the most of them, however, there are no compartments but only walled-in sleeping places, which are covered with hay and moss and with a pair of poor cotton blankets. A wooden scaffold is fixed higher up for storing clothes and utensils. The floor, in its natural state, is neither paved nor boarded, so it is always damp and, in wet weather, soft and gritty." End of quote. Further, she describes the fireplace that is located in the middle of the house and that the smoke can exit either through the roof, through a hole, or through the door and window. 
She also talks about the construction of the roof, which materials are used and how the inhabitants prepare the buildings against storms. I find it very interesting that Berlep's decision to describe this type of building in detail and precisely results from her observation that other authors, in her opinion, were not able to describe this type of building in an adequate way. And she clearly sees herself in the position of describing the huts in a way that one would have an image in one's mind. Emily von Berlepsch's travels writing should be considered in architecture history because she is describing things she had observed that other authors found uninteresting or not worth mentioning. She also talks about buildings that have vanished on ruins or have been altered. Reading her can help us reconstruct these buildings and their history. But Berlepsch is not only describing buildings. Her writings give us also an insight on women's lived reality, economics, landscapes, traditions, and legends. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Elena. So now I invite our first um, external guest, um, Mary Louise Pratt, who I'm sure hardly needs any introducing. Uh, she is Silver Professor Emerita of Spanish and Portuguese and Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University and Olive H. Palmer Professor in the Humanities Emerita at Stanford University. We have the pleasure now to hear her speaking about Juana Manuela Goriti. Mary Louise, can you unmute yourself while we unmute you? Great. And the floor is yours now. Thank you. Um, so yes, the writer I want to introduce is Juana Manuela Goriti, who was born in Argentina in 1818 and died in 1892. So she had a long life straddling one of the most interesting and tumultuous periods of history in Latin America, the decades after independence from Spain, in which life was reorganizing itself at, at almost every level. She, Latin America was a predominantly rural society at that time, particularly Argentina, where she grew up as a with an quite elite landowning family. Her family were um, were liberals in the in a time of tremendous conflict between authoritarianism and uh, liberalism, and where they were forced into exile in Bolivia. Um, after her father had a confrontation with a famous caudillo or strongman named. Facundo Quiroga. She grew up um, educated at home in her father's library. She was a very uh, kind of rebellious, uh, free spirit. And in her early teens, she fell in love with and married a Bolivian army officer um, who ended up uh, and ended up widowed fairly early in her life because he had um, aspirations to become president of Bolivia. So she wound up uh, at a fairly young age with two daughters, a single mother in Lima, which was the center of lettered culture in uh, South America at that time. She became part of a group of, um, of progressive liberal feminist intellectuals there, writers, uh, Clorinda Mato de Turner, Mercedes Cabello de Carbonera, and Gorriti. She founded a school there and also the most eminent and um, respected literary salon uh, in Lima. So her, her house was the site of a great deal of intellectual um, uh, ferment. She, uh, as a, she, she was part of this group of women who were very engaged in public discourse. Um, she, they founded magazines, they ran schools, they were also political targets and they were, she was continually exiled in, back to Buenos Aires. And um, her life was very tumultuous in that way. Architecture, uh, the quotation that Sol found here is an example of her critical voice, uh, her, the critique of Lima, of the city of Lima, and its, its um, capitalistic aspirations after it was kind of taken over by the British, uh, by British economy in, um, in the wool trade in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, so she, it's, it's an example of her critical acerbic voice. Her fiction, however, also um, it it has an important place of, of the built environment, both in terms of, of buildings 
She writes a great deal of, about the history of the surviving history of empire. And her fiction is Gothic um, with Gothic structures where the, the remains of the afterlife of the Spanish empire and the Inca empire persist in underground caves, abandoned mines, cellars where gold is hidden, things like that that were very at odds with the kind of realism that was defining um, narrative in those times. So her, her work um, is, her fiction is very interesting in that way. Her, uh, luckily, her fiction has been translated into English in a collection called Dreams and Realities. In Spanish, it's Sueños y Realidades. It's translated by Sergio Weissman, and I really recommend that book is, is available in, in electronic form or on Kindle. Um, and you can look there and see um, her use of, of, again, of Gothic, term, Gothic architectural codes to translate the legacy of empire in the Andean region is really fascinating. Also like all Latin American writers in this period, her, her writing is both rural and urban. And in her rural writing, the built environment is present always as the road. And there's always only one road. And that road between Buenos Aires and Lima was the main road in Latin America at that time. She traveled it many times at going into exile one place or another and many, many important events happen on that road. Women occupy points on the road and men travel. And that interaction becomes a plot mechanism in, in a number of her most interesting uh, pieces of fiction. So I just um, hope that you will find her and enjoy her. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Marie-Louise. Very fascinating. Next up, we have um, Richard Whitman, uh, who is Associate Professor of Art History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, he will introduce us to Charlotte Eaton, and he's already unmuted. So there you go, Richard. Thank you. Charlotte Ann Eaton, nay Waldi, was born on the 28th of September, 1788, and grew up in a well-to-do Quaker household in Henderside Park in Southern Scotland. The work by Eaton that I'll focus on today concerns Rome, but first some background. Before her Rome book, Eaton had won literary fame with her narrative of a residence in Belgium of 1817, which recounted her experiences with her sister when they, like many other English sisters, wives, and mothers, accompanied their brother to the front for what unfolded as the Battle of Waterloo. As the battle de developed, these women went from complacent holidaymakers to evacuees, impromptu nurses, and horrified eyewitnesses to history. Eaton's account of this harrowing experience had for its centerpiece a gruesome account of the battle, the month, the battlefield, a month after the battle, still smelling of death and being picked over by scavengers. A year later, she and her siblings and their spouses went to Rome for a residence of two years. And in 1820, she published her three volume travel memoir, Rome in the 19th Century. Though published anonymously, the reader quickly learns that the author is female. Eaton always comments when she's forbidden entry as a woman to some shrine or ceremony. She displays an unfailing interest in female saints and in ancient goddesses and empresses. She comments ruefully on how the ancient seating arrangements at the Colosseum, quote, excluded women that despised sex from the seats of the men who appropriated all the best to themselves, and so on. Eaton's book hinges on a vision of ancient Rome as glorious and universal, and of modern Catholic Rome as filthy, bestial, and ultimately oriental. The modern Italians with their laziness, their untrustworthiness, their embarrassing theatrical religiosity, these were not modern Europeans to her. Deep is the fall from imperial to papal Rome, as she intones. The monuments of modern suspicion are here triumphant over the battlemented walls, the falling arches, and the ruined aqueducts of ancient greatness. Roman architectural, Roman Catholic architectural history for Eaton was irredeemably bad. Of San Paolo Fuli de Mora, she writes, quote, amongst all the ugly churches of Rome, this is remarkable for its surpassing ugliness. Of its fine spolia columns taken from a pagan temple, quote, one cannot but wish to knock down the horrible old fabric in which they're shrouded and restore them to light and beauty. As for Bramante's Tempietto, quote, Bramante has contrived to make it a proof that the best of Italian architects would have succeeded as ill in temples as they have done in churches. Of Boromini's remodeling of St. John Lateran, 
which encased ancient spolia columns in a modern shell, she writes, I could not but mourn the loss of the imprisoned granite columns and the waste of marble in the uncouth statues without. At Palazzo Spada, where Borromini built a little optical illusion corridor, she laments that his talents weren't confined to such little works as these. Antiquarians were another eaten target. How I hate antiquarians, she wrote. Antiquarians, quote, destroy all one's happy illusions. They leave nothing in return but dismal doubts and cold uncertainties. She laments having already seen in just a year the Temple of Concord converted into the Temple of Fortune and the Temple of Jupiter Stator into the Comitium. Eaton never hesitates to unleash her own erudition on their theories. When a celebrated antiquary tells her there were never any oracles in ancient Rome, she reels off several named in the Latin sources and concludes dryly that, quote, my friend the antiquary was no great oracle himself, unquote. Antiquarian tedium was another complaint. After describing some current archaeological debate, she refers her skeptical reader to a recent scholarly tome, quote, the task of reading it through will prove a sufficient atonement, if not cure, for your incredulity, unquote. And finally, the book teems with vivid vignettes. Having ascended with her party to the base of the Lantern of St. Peter's, she describes how a naval officer and her group then clambered up the ladder fixed around the gilded ball above and, quote, not satisfied with this exploit, contrived to hoist himself up the sides of the metallic cross and actually seated himself upon its horizontal bar, unquote. The other men in the party were then forced to do the same or felt forced, quote, we were therefore doomed to see these silly men, one after another, go up this terrible place in a posture nearly horizontal, their heads downwards like a fly creeping along a ceiling. We observed the secret fear and agitation painted on their countenances, unquote. But then the women, not to be undone, go up into the gilded ball. Quote, by the time the last had gone up, the first was nearly baked to death, for this globe is heated by the powerful rays of the Italian sun. And then the imperial climax comes when they spontaneously break into God Save the King in full chorus inside the ball. But writes Eaton, long before it was concluded, we were tumbling over each other's heads down the narrow ladder, more eager to get out than we had ever been to get in. Thank you. Quite spectacular. Okay, next up um, is Holly Amber Kennedy, um, who is visiting lecturer here in the Institute for History and Theory of Architecture at ETH <coughs> Zurich. And she will talk to us about Olympe de Gouges. Over to you, Holly Amber. Thank you, Anna. Several years ago, before the pandemic, I began exploring a set of questions as part of a working group called Insurgent Domesticities. These questions brought me to the intriguing figure of Olympe de Gouges, of whom I knew very little. I had simultaneously been invited to participate in a publication on feminist architectural histories of migration. It's, and it's in that context that my interest in de Gouges as an urban interlocutor of rights-based movements took shape. I had at the time been thinking about Frontex, the EU border agency, wondering particularly about the long spatial history of fortress Europe. I was curious about the historical relationship between urban defortification, the turning of a city from a walled to an open place, and the fortification of a nation's borders marking a transformation of the form of the wall and its meaning onto the level of the state and the subsequent relation of dependence between citizenship and the spatial instrument of the border. It seemed imperative to interrogate this relation from the perspective of a witness such as de Gouge, whose life and death referenced and whose writings exposed the exclusionary forms of discrimination that contradicted the ideas of universal citizenship and of democratic civil society at its emergence, and which, at the time of their inscription across her body, remained embedded within the practice of those ideals. On the evening of November 3rd, 1793, on the eastern edge of the Place de la Revolution, the abolitionist playwright, feminist novelist, and political pamphleteer, Olympe de Gouges, a woman of the provinces, born Marie Gouzet, was executed by guillotine having prefigured her death in Article 10 of her pamphlet, Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of the Female Citizen, writing that, quote, a woman has the right to mount the scaffold, she must possess equally the right to mount the speaker's platform. 
Meanwhile, at the moment of her death, an anonymous spectator chronicled the event with a description or a reimagining that cast into the public imagination a fear and a hatred of her political resonance, which would continue for two centuries, alongside the use of such terms as illiterate, uneducated, provincial, immoral, and insane. Yesterday at seven o'clock in the evening, this observer wrote, a most extraordinary person called Olympe de Gouges, who held the imposing title of a woman of letters, was taken to the scaffold, while all of Paris, while admiring her beauty, knew that she hadn't even known her alphabet." End quote. In her writing, for which she was repeatedly jailed, and it was reportedly this text that prompted her execution, de Gouges exposed the conflict between, on the one hand, the principles of natural rights, which informed the French Constituent Assembly's declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen, and the exclusion within that document of women from full political rights on the other. Her texts drew attention to the anti-democratic notion hiding within the category of citizen, that not all persons were fit to become part of the governing class. And in this regard, her writing was aligned with the challenge to the political theory of natural rights first posed in the age of revolutions by the Haitian uprising of indentured black labor. As a playwright, de Gouges was among the first in France to bring the issues of divorce, of the dowry system, and of slavery to the stage, where she linked the absence of female citizenship and the continued disenfranchisement of the underclasses in the French Assembly's constitution to the demand for emancipation and an end to the institution of slavery. Her abolitionism informed her feminism and framed her understanding of equality, which based its claims on inclusion and access to the formation of public powers, while her texts, which she had printed and pasted across the facades of Paris and most poignantly at the gathering places where no females were allowed to speak, narrated the invention of citizenship from the outside. Exploiting the ritual spatial constructs of exclusion and the power over the freedom of movement and of speech, her writing confronted, dramatized, spatialized, and made publicly visible that line, which in the words of Judith Butler and Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, comes to exist politically at the very moment in which someone passes or is refused rites of passage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holly Amber. Just a quick reminder that at the end, we will, um, if there are any questions at the end in the chat, we will pick one or two um, to have a quick reflection. So yeah, anyone in the audience, please do post questions in the chat. Um, next up is uh, Nitin Butler, who is a researcher and filmmaker and lecturer at the Institute of Landscape and Urban Studies um, here at ETH. And he will introduce us to Jemima Morrow. Um, Nitin, are you ready? There you go. Thanks, Anna, for inviting me to this incredibly generative uh, setting and format. So unlike most of you, as Anna just said, uh, I'm not an architecture historian, but uh, rather an urban studies scholar who's interested in filmmaking. And as a non-white, non-European scholar based in Zurich, who is often confined as an area expert to the global South, I've often sought uh, refuge in filmmaking to be able to trace the fluid connections between Switzerland and the rest of the world. And as a means to post-colonize and decolonize with a small p and small d, so it's, it's, it's through this interest in filmmaking that I first encounter uh, Ms. Jemima Morel uh, in, in a popular account and history of tourism in Switzerland. So born in 1833, uh, 1832 rather, uh, to, to a middle-class family in Selby, a quaint town in Victorian England, Morel can be considered um, as one of the first English mass tourists to arrive in Switzerland. In 1863, Morel traveled um, as a part of uh, Thomas Cook's first conducted tour um, of Switzerland with a group of, uh, group referred to as uh, Junior United Alpine Club. The group con uh, it co consisted of Morel's um, two female cousins and it, it followed like a set, set 20 day itinerary that was planned by Thomas Cook. So the Junior United Alpine Club traveled up and down the Alpine transect of Switzerland, lodging in several cities and towns along, along the way, which provided launching points for hikes into the pristine nature of the Swiss countryside as, as it were. 
So Morel is writing at, at the cusp of the birth of the idea of the annual holiday for the um, Victorian middle classes, a period during which uh, the Victorian middle classes were faced with tough choices regarding where to go to dis rediscover oneself from the, uh, away from the city life, to seek communion with nature in the footsteps of poets and painters of the picturesque and the sublime such as John Ruskin. So what distinguishes Morel as a traveler despite being on an organized tour is the meticulous and detailed journal she maintained during the tour, which was later published as Miss Jemima's Swiss Journal. In her writing, Morel constantly engages in a comparison between Ruskin's writings on the Alpine landscape and her own experience confronting his notion of the sublime with her portrayal of the extreme poverty of the peasantry and of spectacles designed to attract the tourist uh, attention. The people blowing up cannonballs into mountain faces to trigger avalanches to entertain tourists for a few bucks, for example. Um, uh, the, the, the journal provides crucial clues as to how tourism was, be, was inscribing itself in the territory in the mid 19th century and how the landscape infrastructure and architecture of Switzerland was being shaped in the image of the itinerant mass tourist. Um, in her writing, Morel uh, draws critical distinctions between the vernacular architecture and its sensitivity towards climate and community and the eclectic architecture of tourism and landscape of spectacles such as bathhouses, grand hotels that were being laid over this landscape. So she makes notes of the rhythms in which waves of populations pass into and out of, uh, of these landscapes. And uh, in her writings, Morel uh, attempts to blur the binaries between the city and nature, blending them together, discovering the city in nature and nature in the city and enlivening these sort of uh, crossovers through small details. Um, so these accounts are, however, also interspersed with un unsettling vignettes, such as uh, how she describes Swiss porters in Interlaken as a sw swarming group of termites, um, sort of haggling for, for a few bucks. So the, the image of Morel as a vulnerable Victorian woman delicately balancing in her um, low-heeled shoes on icy glaciers of the Bernese overland is often mobilized to produce a propaganda around the globetrotting British tourists that seeks to achieve victory over the landscape. So whether it be the 1963 Pathe documentary that sought to retrace Morel's journey through Switzerland or the Swiss English writer De Conbuis's account in Morel. So Morel's writings, um, however, try to achieve quite the opposite. She dwelled upon uh, the gendered nature of urban space and details like where should a woman be while she's being on tour. So the countryside rather than being a pristine space for her offers a space, safe space away from the otherwise heavily gendered urban space. Um, so perhaps I'll leave it at that for, for this short talk. And uh, what I'm uh, perhaps trying to do is also make a film on her, uh, but from, from, from her witnessing you know, the landscape. So thanks, Anna, for inviting me. Right, thank you very much, Nitin. Wait a minute until the slide turns. Great, so the next uh, speaker is Dam Lagure, who's um, a PhD fellow also here at the Institute for the History and Theory of Architecture at the chair of Professor Martin Del Becke. And she will introduce us to Niga Hanin. Um, Damla, it's over to you. Niga Hanin is most famously known to be the first Ottoman woman poet who lived in Istanbul between 1862 and 1918. She published numerous poetry books and theater plays throughout her life, became the lead writer of the longest running women's journal in the empire, and received hard to achieve international media coverage for her time. Of course, she was not anyone. She was a woman born into a wealthy family, a family who would provide the means for her education and be the kind of support she could rely on. As a matter of fact, the signature she had chosen to use, Nigar bint Osman, in other words, Nigar, the daughter of Osman, clearly re reflected the position she bargained for and accommodated herself in the strict patriarchal system. But for a woman without familial ties with the court, and especially for a Muslim woman, her public presence was striking in its context and inspirational for others. Nigar Hanum did not reflect her personal opinions on literature or thoughts on political matters in her diary. Instead, she used her diary as a medium where she could release her emotions 
and record every experience that would break the cycle of her quote-unquote boring loneliness, as she would call it. A torturous divorce, illnesses, and being unable to become a housewife in her own family house doomed Nigar Hanum to suicidal thoughts. Her diary was like an imaginary friend to whom she could vent out the pressure. So in her diary, she became her own chronicler. She obsessively registered the names, domestic tasks, daily incidents, or entertainments that would sum up her life. And I think these registers can be exceptional sources for architectural history because they warmly invite us to the personal space of a harem woman without rendering our gazes as invaders. When we are accompanied beyond the walls by insiders, it becomes clearer how women could strategize certain ways to reclaim spaces of their own, despite, despite all the concrete constraints is imposed on them. And moreover, we encounter the great performative quality of reclaimed spaces, which would not be possible to read from conventional sources. For example, we learn from Nigar Hanum's diary that her artistic practices were beyond living ink on paper. She used a room of her house, her salon as she would call it, as a hub to gather her network of friends and perform together. She noted down one of her salon gatherings with these words, May 21, 1889. On Wednesday, I supervised everything in the morning in order not to have any flaws in the service to our guests. We were around 15 people at the dinner. After the dinner, Mademoiselle sang La Franca songs in turns and the artists played the piano. As they have insisted upon, I also sang an Alaturka song. Then we danced waltz, polka, mazurka, and quadrille. When the visitors left, it was already past midnight. These hard to track moments of word sociability left no other archives. The list of members, evening program, and special mapping in Niger Hanum's diary indicates that she could promote her poems, songs, and her talents in her immediate surrounding. Her salon was a physical and metaphorical venue where she could amplify her public persona and stabilize her reputation in society. Another way to reclaim spaces was to adjust the material conditions of these forms of sociabilities. In her diary, we observe Nigar Hanum constantly looking for real estate to rent, moving houses, shopping, organizing, embellishing, and decorating. She crafted the salon that would become her vitrine. In a sense, she produced herself through consuming either architecture, things of popularity, or objects of prestige, and thus communicated her taste and her social standing. For example, on June 20, 1888, she noted down, at half an hour in the morning, I went out to bed, drank my milk, and while playing the piano, they informed me about the arrival of the Rattan cellar. I was busy first with emptying and then organizing the salon, so the Rattan furniture was placed there. On October 28, she was still busy with a similar task. Yesterday and the day before, I was busy placing the furnishings and house decorating as I was doing for the last 15 days. Nigar Hanum's diary is a repository for various shreds of evidence indicating how she created spaces and her public identity through her agent, agency in, in these spaces. Being guided by her diary shifts our position in the realm from an intruder to an insider and stresses why women's writings are relevant to architectural historiography. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Damla. Um, now we're coming to our last uh, speaker, was uh, Nilufar Rasuli, who is a first year doctorate fellow in the Institute of History and Theory of Architecture as well here at GTR ETH Zurich. Um, and we have the pleasure now to hear her speaking about Bibi Kanum Astarabadi. Over to you, Nilufar. Thank you very much, Anna. And now she starts to read. This is the book of men's vices. It is 1894, we are in Tehran, Iran. In a room inside an andarun, the woman's section in households where their life must be lived behind the closed doors and draped windows, where they must sit, eat, walk, look, and talk as they've been told to, where they must stay silent, not read, not write, not speak, not ask, not want, and later disappear as they've never existed before. 
We are in the same room as such, however, sitting in a secret meeting, circling a woman, circulating her book among us and seeking our pain in her words, as we know that her voice will not let our voices to be disappeared, as her words are our words, as her scratches are our scratches on the wall, strong, sharp, radical, and beautiful. And now she starts to read Haza Kitab al Rajal. The woman reading for us is Bibi Khanum as Sarawadi, an educator, a fighter, a protester, a writer, and a woman's rights sufferer. In this year that we are sitting beside her, a woman's voice, like her body, is still her orat, Podenda. It is a voice, must be covered behind the curtains and walls. It is an un unnecessary murmur. It pollutes the air. It must remain unheard. However, this is Bibi Khanum who takes the first step, writes Malibu Rajal, signs it with her own name, and brings her personal stories to make a counter response to Hadibul Bol Naswan, Disciplining Women a book anonymously written in the 1880s to teach men how to discipline their wives, daughters, and andarun. And now we start to hear her voice reading Haza Kitab al Rajal. This is a woman's response to disciplining women. He said that a woman must sit farthest from the tablecloth, sit on her knees, eat delicately, not talk, not make any sound, and not comment on the conversation. It means that she must play pantomime. Yes, if a man and a woman, in the manner of Europeans, go to a hotel, perhaps they can behave according to his instructions. In Europe, according to travel and geography books, all women are respected and educated, and they sit at the table with stranger men, and at the time of dancing, they take the hands of other men. But Islam's rules are different. All Iranian women are trapped in housekeeping and servanting. The author takes his own taste as an example and says that a wife might sit far from the husband. And this is the same idea of servanthood that he has dreamed of that I have mentioned before. We step back from our imaginary room to read her one more time, Haza Kitab al Rajal, a woman's response to disciplining women, a book that links women's suffering to the male disciplinary orders of the built environment, a book that is written from, about, and against Andarun, a place where a woman has no rights to be its citizen. She is simply present without knowing how to be present. A man must teach her sitting orders, walking etiquette, and sleeping manners. So as she learns her vents and vents in this place, she must never ask why, she just have to obey. This is Bibi Hanum that brings her and other women's whys to the front of enclosing walls. Her book is a counter instruction for women about how not to sit farthest from their uh, tablecloths, not to sit on their knees, not to eat delicately, to talk, to make a lot of sound, and to comment on the conversation. And now we enter an imaginary room where Bibi Hanum is standing. We are seeing Bibi Hanum through what her granddaughter imagined and painted of her. Likewise, we imagine Andarun by reading Bibi Hanum, imagining by reading and portraying by imagining. To enter this room, we have to read her clothes word by word in between the lines to better hear other women's voices in her voice, voices reaching us from the past, from behind those closed doors and draped windows. However, speaking about our today's sufferings, we know all this by reading Bibi Hanum. We know that they were living there, but they didn't get used to it. Like us, we are living in these decades of blood and ashes, but we are not getting used to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nilofar. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, this has been brilliant, I think, so far. Um, we've got a couple of minutes um, for questions from the audience. There's two questions um, in the q and I'll start with the first one, which I think is um, fascinating, um, which goes towards the direction of, you know, how, what do we do with these women now and where do they fall into our scholarly outputs, let's say. So we might read these women. And I know that for some of you, 
Um, these women are very central to your scholarship and for others, they are more of a, let's not say side product, but a side discovery maybe that might still lead hopefully to more, but is not a, a central object of, of study right now for your work. So maybe if anyone wants to I'll just throw this in there. So the question is, have you faced any difficulties you had to think of alternative methodologies for incorporating such sources into your scholarly writing on architecture or the built environment in the widest sense, I would add. Anyone wants to pick that up? I think that uh, is something that is an, is an interesting question because we have been during the day engaged in a reading workshop, which is also exploring a different methodology to approach the sources and reading the sources and paying attention to the narrative and the voices of women. So it's, it's something that we are exploring our project and also we would like to publish shortly. And we've been practicing this uh, in terms of the different workshops that we're using and taking feminist methodology that is usually used in interviews or diaries or journal entries uh, to read and pay attention uh, to change the way of reading before even we start writing. So there's also, I think that there's an importance in how we read these sources uh, from an architectural history perspective to integrate it in our work. Um, so yeah, yeah, follow us and you will know more about it soon. Yes, yeah, that's great. Like, so I think, I mean, um, without, we're gonna go to the second question in a minute, but I think, Referring back to Holly Amber's um, talk, she, you know, Holly Amber, you very clearly outlined how you came across Olympe de Gouges in a, in a very different context, in a very different period. And I think that's that these trajectories are very interesting and they're very interesting to include in the output. I don't know whether you want to say a sentence about that. Well, well yeah, I think it's, you know, that, and I had a couple of conversations with you this week um, with several of you already in this panel about the, kind of predicament of, um, you know, the conflict, which is interesting to write through, the conflict of imagining these women as architectural interlocutors, imagining them in the role of, um, if not, you know, designers than witnesses. Um, and I think what's interesting is what became clear to me with Degouge is to imagine her in this way, um, which is to see space as it was for her, um, I had to understand how the text is interacting with the environment, um, which is to say that I had to understand her act of writing as situated. So in that sense, I think then there is a methodology in the text itself and in the impossibilities that brought the text to life, let's say. So sort of writing through the paradoxes, I think becomes a kind of method, I think, um, that remits back to the question of why is it so difficult to imagine mm -hmm. these protagonists as mm -hmm. occupying this platform? Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, so there's um, two more questions. Let's see whether we have time for both, but I'm gonna start with a question by Christian Pareno, who has been presenting in a previous, um, workshop and a colloquium that we held in May. And he asks that in most of the women introduced, boredom and tedium appear as motivators for their work, also as reactions to their circumstances. So anyone on the panel, could you elaborate on this situation in relation to their spatial experience or spatiality? I don't maybe say situatedness. Anyone wants to pick that up? We feel that, Richard, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, just because um, I, I feel like it's a, a topos of bourgeois literature by both men and women in the 19th century that you, and maybe beyond the 19th century, but certainly in the 19th century, I, would, I wouldn't see it as a specifically female thing. Mm -hmm. I've just encountered it in so many other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's good to, to put that in context. Yeah. Anyone else had boredom, tedium, the ensuing frustration um, encountered? Maybe I could very shortly, uh, I mean, in my protagonist, um, well, boredom is very much uh, all over her, her writing. Uh, and interestingly, uh, in, well, she's very much 
very much bored in her house, but also uh, her house is very much the place that she could find uh, entertainment by, by her salon. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, her house is very much the place the, uh, that she stretches herself in society and, uh, and also mm -hmm. um, in, in the built environment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we can take the third question as well, and um, maybe we can frame that a little bit more generally around mobility, which I sort of thought was very interesting because that clearly so lots of the, the texts we've heard about were travel texts, but in, in lots of other texts as well, it was about movement or not movement, as, as Mary Louise, you pointed out that um, um, Goriti writes a lot about the road and women staying and, and men traveling and herself traveling it and the question here is whether is this you know whether this transgression out of the domestic architectural space is already a, a transgression for the woman and what kind of role movement and the freedom to move maybe plays in their in, in their having a public voice. Richard. Yeah. Just speaking about Charlotte Eaton, who is, you know, these women are all different. I think that the question would, could perhaps be nuanced to take into consideration questions of class and of privilege and also of national, um, you know, uh, power and privilege. I mean, Charlotte Eaton, it would be impossible to read through the three volumes of her travels around Rome and to think of her as being as oppressed as most of the other people she encounters. I mean, maybe not the people in her party. Um, and I have no idea how much, you know, trouble her, you know, husband gave her when she announced she wanted to write a book or whatever. I mean, I'm sure those, you know, she was as much a victim of that as any other woman of her time. But the, the coachmen, the Italians, the uh, servants, um, she's, she's somebody who, um, you know, is a person of privilege. And she's also highly educated. I mean, she's educated in the Latin and the Greek classics. So I don't, I mean, there were domestic expectations of somebody like her. Um, I mean, you saw her portrait at the beginning with her two children. Um, but I, I would not say that she's transgressing her expected role by being out in Rome and even necessarily by writing this book. Yes, it would be true of other women, but not someone as privileged as Eaton. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. She's maybe using it more to, to uh, frame herself in the view of the other as superior. Yeah. Mary Louise. Yeah. I was just going to add that, um, that in kind of bourgeois Western modernity, that physical mobility is equated with uh, often with no, with knowing and learning right and the the knowledge the knowledge making subject is the subject who travel who's traveling and and um, we we re so that there there's a particular paradigm of going and staying that's kind of and everyone who moves is moving in in relation to people who are staying right and travel is always a sequence of a serial experience of hosting along the way because people have to stop and be hosted or and and um but I, I think that it's it's interesting to recognize the kind of occidentalism built into that idea of the knowing of the knowing subject as the mobile subject and as the, the place subject that's not moving as a subject who is unknowing and and um ignorant and and lacking in something right lacking in freedom and uh so that that paradigm is kind of built into um this this corpus in a way and in our in our own in our own thinking about it in a way that um you know you that you know, today indigenous scholars are kind of sh saying highlighting the particular uh the particularity of that of that paradigm but I think thinking of travel moving in terms of going and staying is really important. Um, and thinking of uh, s both moving and staying as uh, as crossing over the, cr the question of belonging crosses through that that paradigm. Where do you have an experience of belonging? And you can have you can be confined to a space and where you, you feel what, where you have an experience of unbelonging. It doesn't belonging doesn't necessarily mean stationariness. Anyway, I was just going to complicate those terms a little yeah. bit. Of course. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really important to complicate those terms. Um, not to 
I think. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to pick that up? Otherwise, I think we're sharp on time. No, fabulous. Thank you so much um, to all speakers, to our guests, to Mary Louise and to Richard and to the fabulous people here at ETH. Um, thank you very much to Sol, who has designed the beautiful PowerPoint presentation that we've seen and did all the timings and it worked all smoothly. Um, thanks to Elena, who's also been important on the team to conceive this whole project. And thank you to everyone else. Thank you to Lucia, um, who um, has been silently working in the background to keep us running. Um, and thank you to the audience for the questions. Please do follow us um, on our social media channels on our website. Uh, come knocking on the door here in Zurich. Um, and we hope to see you all very soon. Thank you very much. And goodbye.